celebrating 13 years of possibility. Pilot Flying J and Halloran Hilton Hill present Anything is Possible. Today's guest, Hossein Garashi, Part 1. Welcome to another edition of Anything is Possible. My name is Halloran Hilton Hill. These are great stories about great people whose lives are proof that anything is possible. And we welcome to the broadcast today, Hossein Garashi. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you, sir. I appreciate now, the invitation. We, we tape at a studio, River Media, and uh, you live right next door, really, mm -hmm. and you work next door, and so you didn't have a long commute to be here, but I'm honored to have you in studio. Thank you. Everybody in your family is a physician. That's correct. Uh, your brothers and sisters, your siblings, how many physicians are there in your family? Actually, both from my mother's and my father's side, as far back as we can, uh, we have documents for the, as the, for the family tree, they all have been physicians. So on, would this online. span generations? Absolutely. I think we can go, I, we, I think we went back about maybe 10 generations and they were all physicians. 10 generations of physicians on, on both sides. On both sides of the family. And so I was one of the first that uh, kind of deviated from the norm. Yeah, this is quite a deviation when you have that kind of uh, DNA and I would imagine that there is an expectation. I mean, the path is there. Um, but you decided to do something different. Engineering is what called you. And my understanding is you found that love in a very interesting way. Uh, actually, I fell into it because uh, of, uh, I mean, my father was an eye surgeon and he introduced me to the physics of the eyes. Uh, and then I was interested in, in his makeup. And then he took me to a, uh, to a surgery. And it was then that I decided I think I want to do something else and engineering and technical things of my love. So that's how I deviated in that direction. You're from Iran. How did you end up in the United States of America? Um, when I was 16, I participated in a program, in a, in a foreign exchange program called AFS, American, American Field Service. It's a great program. It's a, it's a program that creates cultural exchanges between two countries. And I was one of the 16 selected to come over. They, they did a whole lot of interviews, and they tried to match the background of the families. So I ended up in Barrington, Illinois, Barrington, uh, and attended Barrington High School. And that was the start of the, being introduced to the US and basically uh, you know, uh, realizing that this is where I want to end up. Now, I understand that you became an ambassador for that very program. That's true. Actually, one of the uh, objectives of the program is to stay here for one year, go to school, and attend many uh, public speaking forums, you know, various high schools, and tell the people about the culture of your country, basically right. introduce your country. And then I would go back home after a year after finishing high school. I went back home and I did the same thing back home. So it's a kind of, as I mentioned, exchange of uh, cultures and and ideas, and, uh, and, and it worked really well. What were you telling people about your country and your culture I found at that, that time? Well, being 16 years old, of course, you realize that, uh, that, the, that the concentration was <clears throat> mostly around some of the customs that I knew, <laughs> and then also maybe about a student's life and a teenage life back home and how, does it, how it differs from the, from the ones in the U.S. Uh, students like that, and they would ask a lot of questions, uh, you know, going into more details. So a little bit about the history, a little bit about maybe the education program at the high school that I attended, but about 50, 60 percent of the focus was on, a, on an average teenage life back home. Now you're sampling American culture. You're getting to attend lots of lectures. You're getting to experience the United States of America. When did it become definitive for you? Like. I need to be here. This may be hard to believe, but I was here for three months. The first three months that I was here, I came to the conclusion that this is where I would like 90 to be. 90 days. 90 days, and I was only 16 and a half, 17 years old at the time. And what did you experience in 90 days that sealed the deal? I liked what, without going into too much detail, I liked the people. I liked the way people treated each other. 
I like this, in a way, the simplicity of life, and at the same time, the honesty and integrity of life. Uh, I, I, to me, that's something that really appealed to me. Mm. And, and I felt like that, that, that's when I felt that this is, this is the place that I would eventually would like to end up. In. It so happened that way. Let's take a break when we come back. Now I've got to link how you ended up at good old Rocky Top at the University of Tennessee. How did you end up here? Because you could have ended up anywhere in America and you ended up here. My guest is Hossein Garashi. We'll be back with more. This is Anything is Possible. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up. We were invited to actually go to the White House. And I was one of the few, one of the few who was selected. We went to the White House and I met John F. Kennedy. It was an honor, an, an honor for me at that time as a young, young person. And uh, I will never forget that day. Welcome back to Anything is Possible. I'm Haller in Hilton Hill, and this is Hossein Garashi. He is the CEO of Ooster Technologies. Thank you for being here today. So you, within 90 days, know that America is the place for you. That's correct. I'm, your country and your culture is so rich with traditions and tradition, and I'm trying to figure out a, a, a family tree that goes back 10 generations of physicians. That's 10 generations of expectation. You get to the United States of America, 90 days, you know you're supposed to be here when I would imagine your mind, heart, soul, body is connected to all of that tradition, all of that culture, and you get here and go, boom, this is it. That to me seems like a big break. It seems like something more than just something happened there. I, you didn't have any family pressure to go, well. You know, the, the culture of where you are born never leaves you. There are many things that I I cherish and I carry with me and I hope that it's been transferred to my children. But at the same time, I've been lucky to be open-minded enough that when I go to a new culture and I see the good things of it. I like to say, I like to think that I have captured good things from both cultures. And what I saw here, I liked and that's when I made that decision. As a 16 year old, you end up at the White House, you meet JFK? I was lucky enough at the end of the year, uh, there was a group, uh, we were invited to actually go to the White House. And I was one of, the few, one of the few who was selected. We went to the White House and I met John F. Kennedy. It was an honor, an, an honor for me at that time as a young, young person. And uh, I will never forget that day. Uh, the, he came to the, to, the, to the White House lawn and talked to us and came and shook our hands and talked to us about the program that we've been and what we plan to do. Very, was very, that inspiring to you? Very much so, unbelievable, yeah. The University of Tennessee though, how do you end up at the University of Tennessee? Well, after I, after I graduated from high school in Barrington and went back home, after two years, I, as I mentioned, my plan was to end up in the U.S. I wanted to be an electrical engineer, so I searched and I found the University of Tennessee. It was one of them, back then it was one of the top rated, top 20 schools as far as electrical engineering was concerned. And so uh, I ended up here, and actually as a byproduct of me coming here, I think I ended up having at least a minimum of 30 more, 30 plus people who came, other students who came with the connection that I established here. So uh, I was lucky enough to end up in here and then of course then the work, uh, you know, the work history started after that in Knoxville. But uh, So you study engineering, a lot of it, the country was looking for engineers. There were a lot of engineering jobs. I understand that you had a professor, I think his name was Gooch. Dr. Gooch. Who, uh, Dr. Gooch said to you, I've been observing you. I don't think you're cut out for that. That being maybe going to TVA or someplace like that. What exactly did he see in you that says you're not supposed to follow the normal path that an electrical engineer would follow? Actually, that's a good question. Professor Gouge is one of the many people that I'm indebted to. Um, he was my advisor, and uh, I think he looked he looked at people, engaged them, and felt like what would be, what would fit them the best in terms of their future endeavors. And at that time he was consulting with a company, small, very small company here in town called Special Instruments Laboratory, mm -hmm. Spin Lab. He O'Neill was the founder and the president of the company. And he suggested that I go there. Even though everybody heard of electrical engineering 
graduate, uh, graduates at that time would, uh, would move to TVA, uh, he suggested that I go there. And I did. And uh, the only one of the group that we were studying together who ended up in a much lower paying job, but about a factor of 10 more exciting and interesting from what my colleagues did, my, my, my fellow friends did. And uh, I loved the job. It allowed me to practice all aspects of engineering, manufacturing, and, uh, and design. And so it was the start of my, my professional life. So you got, a, you got a chance to learn business in the round, the full concept of business from design to sales to implementation. Exactly. Yeah. It was a very unique opportunity. So here's what I didn't know. For years we've been taping in this studio. I've been seeing Ooster Technologies next door. Uh, I've never known what ha you know, happened there, but then I started to hear about your story, this fascinating company. And when we talked before this interview, you were trying to explain to me the kind of the, the cotton supply chain, how it all works. I did not know that Knoxville is considered maybe the cotton fiber testing capital of the world, but this is what shocked me. A hundred million bales of cotton a year produced in the world, about 50 billion pounds of cotton. You have to grade and score it so you know how to price it and how to place it in the supply chain. HVI, you and a couple of other engineers developed a technology that is used around the world. Did you ever see any of that coming? My understanding is your instruments are used to test about 35 billion of the 50 billion pounds of cotton that are tested in the world. Did you ever see that coming? Because that's, that's mega. The very, you know, very accurate information. Cotton is maybe just a little bit of a, you know, few lines of history. The cotton is cotton price, cotton valuation, and its proper application in the in the textile mills is based on its physical pro physical properties. And and before instrumentation was on the market, a human classers determined the the uh, these. A few of these properties that they could, right. and they were basically eye by eye. They were grading the cotton, so the <clears throat> the technology was in a way to actually replace a cotton cla a human cotton classer with technology, while expanding more physical fiber properties that could be measured. Right. Um, Spin Lab at the time, at the Spin Lab, the group of us were working on the project that we could maybe combine multiple measurements in one instrument that the United States Department of Agriculture would be interested in grading all of the U.S. cotton. And so that's the project started as high volume instruments, short name HVI, and of course we had no idea where it would go. And, and, and my colleagues and I were involved in this project and it turned out to be one of the best products of this company. And uh, you're right, it is actually the world standard for cotton valuation and cotton measurement, and every bale of 35, I mean, basically 35 billion pounds, as you mentioned, of cotton is samples of the different cotton is tested on these instruments worldwide. That's They're very a, proud of it. That's a very big business. It is. How big of a business is that for you? Well, I can tell you that the, in the age that everything is imported from China, over the past eight years, we have exported about $70 million worth of this instrument alone to China. Wow. And the government of China, the USDA equivalent of, of Chinese government utilizes these instruments to test 100% of the Chinese grown cotton. That is amazing. And isn't that an amazing story of possibility? That, that three guys in Knoxville, Tennessee, could take on a challenge because that's what engineers do. They solve problems. They believe in possibility and that it would be solved here by you and a great team. I know when we talked before you said, Howard, let's be clear, it's a team of people working on great ideas. Absolutely, and the, the whole, the success of the project is not only because of that, due to that engineering team, but also to all the great colleagues at the Spen Lab then and at Ooster Technologies today. It's the makeup of all the, of all the great people that we have that makes the company successful. There's a big difference between being an engineer and a CEO. Maybe, 
I mean, maybe a CEO is just a different type of engineer. But the skill sets that surround running a major worldwide corporation, and I mean, you're all over the world, maybe are a little bit different than just being um, an engineer. Um, I want to take a break, and when we come back in a minute, I'd like for you to talk about making that leap. How you, how you discovered that you were not only just an engineer, but you were placed here to be a leader as well. And I want to talk about becoming an American citizen, because you said you've been to, I think you said 48 countries, and uh, you said this is it. This is it. We'll talk more to Hossein Garashi in just a moment. You're watching Anything is Possible, and he's proof. Coming up. A good leader should be like a yo-yo, that you can easily go to the top and see the big picture, and then just as easily, quickly go down to the little nitty-gritty things. This week, our home federal community spotlight is on Helen Ross McNabb Center. Did you know that Helen Ross McNabb Center provides more than 80 programs and services? To learn more and see how you could get involved, visit McNabbCenter.org. I'm so glad to have you here. Um, I think your story is a great story of possibility. My name is Halloran Hilton Hill. This is Anything is Possible. I love what I get to do because I get to kind of map the DNA of possibility and learn, and I'm learning from, from you today. So um, making that leap from being an engineer to being a CEO, um, how'd that come about? Well, the, um, I was elevated uh, from engineer to engineering director and then and the vice president of engineering and R&D and engineering. And the, um, the, I, I found out that in order to be successful, you just can't have, you, you can't, you cannot just have a great design team. Rather, you, you must also s see the steps beyond that, you know, see, see the bigger picture. How, how is this design used? What is the best way of uh, applying it? How do, you, how do you gauge the market needs to whereas you modify your designs, you know, accordingly? I found those to be important, and I gradually gravitated in that direction. And, uh, and in dealing with some of the large customers like USDA and, and CFIP and other places in the world, I, I, I became a, an ambassador hmm. and that I would travel to these people, talk to them, learn about their needs, and I would come back and I would, I would convey it to the design team and try to maneuver and, and place our products in a, uh, in a proper fashion. Um, the, I always, for a long time, I always kept a piece of the pie for myself of the projects. But as the management duties became larger and larger, they grew, I realized that I'm becoming, I, 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 can, I can become a bottleneck in the actual design and, and the development process. So sadly, I had to leave that behind and now I'm an obsolete engineer because <laughs> the technology has outpaced me quite a bit. Um, I tell uh, my colleagues that a good leader should be like a yo-yo, that you can easily go to the top and see the big picture, and then just as easily, quickly go down to the n little nitty-gritty things. I think if I don't pat myself on the back, I have this capability, and I think that has, that has uh, helped out with the, uh, my success. Is that something you became, or is it something you were that just needed to be revealed? You know, it's a good question, and to be honest with you, I can't tell you I know exactly which is what. I knew that from the beginning, I wouldn't be just happy with a small project management, that there had to be something beyond that, and that is connectivity between what you create and what the actual user uses and applies it. And, and, you know, and, and, and in many organizations, there's a big gap between these two. A lot of people make great products but unfortunately, they're not in touch in a, in a hundred percent way with the market and how they use it, what the needs are. So, It feels like all of the universe is connected to season cycles and systems and that the, the greatest leaders will come to figure out what the season cycles and systems are and find the way to sync what they do with what is actually going on. And I, I've noticed that in leaders. They want to know the whole picture. They want to know how it all connects. And then they become 
like you said, ambassadors, up and down, right? right? Because you got to go back to your people and and pass the binocular, show them what you're seeing. So so that's a that's a pretty big deal. Um, so talk to me about becoming an American. Well, the uh, of course that was always in the in the plans anyway, and the first opportunity was uh, when everything was all the documents were in place was I think it was 1983, and the big day big day came finally and uh, went to the courthouse, went through the ceremonies. One of the uh, extremely exciting day, I, I imagine the life of anybody, any of the uh, any of the uh, folks who become naturalized citizen. So great. Great, great emotions. You know, for me, it was important that knowing that becoming an American citizen doesn't mean that I'm losing my heritage and my culture. For me, it was a, it was adding to it. It was taking the best parts of both worlds and being able to, to achieve it by becoming a citizen and and uh, and, and being able to contribute. Uh, to the to the to the community and the, and the society that I lived and the folks that I worked with, so exciting, exciting, extremely exciting. America is a place of possibility, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And I must say before I forget that uh, I owe uh, I owe a great amount of, of, of gratitude to University of Tennessee, to Hugh Neal of uh, of Spen Lab to the technology, my colleagues, and at the end, last but not least, to this country that makes anything possible. Wow, that's great. You know what, this is not enough time for, for me to ask you all the questions I have. Tell you what, we're gonna make a part two. Um, let's take a break here. When we come back, we'll continue with part two of my conversation with Hossein Garashi. Thanks for being here today.